you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 12, and I shall be reading from verse 25. So Hebrews 12, you can find it on page 1211. And it would be good as ever for you to keep your Bibles open. So Hebrews 12, reading from verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he is promised. Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what, so, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably, with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word, your word which is spirit and life. And Lord, we ask that you would please minister that word to us now. Please equip me to speak and all of us to hear what you would say to each one of us. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we return to the book of Hebrews, that wonderful New Testament letter written to encourage beleaguered Christians, to encourage them to stand firm and not give up. The name of the letter, Hebrews, gives us a clue to the identity of the first recipients of the letter. As we've already seen, they were Jewish Christians who were facing persecution because they'd accepted Jesus as the promised Messiah, the fulfilment of the Old Testament scriptures. The writer of this letter wanted his readers to realise just what we have in Christ, to realise its worth, to hold on, and to keep going. In the preceding verses, the writer, writer compared two co the two covenants. The Old Testament one, given at Mount Sinai, mediated through Moses, a covenant of law and rules, and the new covenant brought in through Jesus, a covenant of grace. The writer wanted us to see the difference between the two. Moses was given the law at Mount Sinai. God gave him the law, his requirements for humanity. A law which, if kept, would provide a perfect frame, framework for a free and harmonious society, for a free and harmonious relationship with God and with one another. The Old Covenant was dependent on keeping the law. To break the commandments, to sin cuts us off from God. The new covenant does what the old could not. To sin, to break the commandments, kills us. It cuts us off from God. It cuts us off from life forever. But to the new covenant, God brings us grace, his own favour and forgiveness of sin. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, offered himself as the sacrifice of atonement. His death, his blood, deals with the problem of sin. He brings us God's forgiveness. He reconnects us to God. And through his resurrection, he brings us life. In the preceding verses, the writer compares the two covenants. 
In verse 25, he warns us. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, that was Moses, he warned the people not to reject God. Because they would be rejecting life. Moses warned the people not to disobey or forsake the covenant because in rejecting it, they would be rejecting God and therefore again, they would be rejecting life. If they did not escape when they refused Moses who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from Jesus, him who warns us from heaven? If we turn away from Jesus, no sacrifice for sins is left. He is God's lifeline to us, God's gift of himself. So we would be most foolish and most tragic if we were to refuse him. And in verse 26, the writer again takes us back to Sinai where the whole mountain trembled violently as God descended on it. The earth shook because the majesty, glory and power of the all-holy God as he came down to meet with, with the people and make the covenant with them. As he descended, so the ground shook in response. At that time, verse 26, his voice shook the earth but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And in that, the writer of Hebrews is quoting the prophet Haggai, a prophecy of the coming judgment. When the ground shook at Sinai, it would be a pale imitation of what God is going to do. When the writer quotes, quotes Haggai, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. God will shake all things in the judgment, revealing all things for what they are. The earth and the heavens will flee from his presence, Revelation 20. All of creation that is stained with human sin will flee because it stand, because it cannot stand before his awesome holiness. We must therefore make sure that we are standing on that which cannot be shaken. With the coming of Jesus, <coughs> the Old Testament, <coughs> The old covenant, rather, the temple and its sacrifices were redundant. The sacrifice of Jesus achieved what all the sacrifices in the temple and the tabernacle could not. Those who depend on anything other than Jesus are on rocky ground. They will not stand in the judgment. All that is stained with sin will be punished and banished from God's holy presence. All, the, all that will be shaken and will not stand. But in Jesus we have something that cannot be shaken. The writer wants us to realise just what we have in Jesus. The value of the salvation that we have in him. That salvation is absolute. It cannot be shaken. It cannot be taken away from us unless we choose to repudiate it. So the writer concludes in verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. If we will accept Jesus as the Lord of our lives and Saviour, if we'll turn away from sin, from all that displeases God, and commit our lives, ourselves, and our futures to him, and we enter the kingdom of God. The word kingdom 
in the Greek does not signify a physical kingdom with boundaries and borders. It means the active rule of a king. And if we accept Jesus as Lord, then he becomes our rightful king and rules in our hearts and lives. This is the kingdom that cannot be shaken. As Jesus willing subjects, we belong to him. Our citizenship lies with him in the new Jerusalem in the age which is to come. And that cannot be shaken, nor can it be taken from us. The old order of things is passing away. But what we have in Jesus is permanent and unshakable. So we can have absolute confidence in him. At the beginning of our first reading from the book of Revelation, John the Apostle, the beloved disciple of John's Gospel, writes, I, John, your brother, and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. That's how John identifies himself. Because we've accepted the loving and merciful rule of Jesus in our lives, because we are subjects of his kingdom, we are no longer citizens of this fallen world. From the, from, that, from the moment we accepted him, we're always on a collision course with the world. We will clash with, the, with worldly people. We will go against the direction of this fallen world. And for some, that will mean suffering. Some of our brothers and sisters are suffering now in places such as China, Nigeria, Iran, even Gaza. It's a part of the Christian experience. So John writes that he's our brother and companion in the suffering that must come at some point. And we need to learn that we are brothers and sisters of the Christians who face persecution. And as such, we're responsible for them and must pray for them and support them. As John identifies himself there, so we need to learn to be companions with them in their suffering so they know that they're not alone. And if at some point we face persecution, then they likewise will be companions with us. But we're not just to be companions in suffering with them. For as John carries on, we're also companions with him and with them in the kingdom of God and of Christ. And this should spur us on to patient endurance, to keep going when life gets hard, to keep the faith, to celebrate and value the kingdom that we are receiving, the kingdom that cannot be shaken, that cannot be snatched from us. We get a taste of it now. But when Jesus returns, we enter in to the full experience. What we have in Christ is better than everything. What we have in Christ is worth the endurance. And as our brothers and sisters have proven, it is worth the suffering. So blessed are those who have put themselves under Jesus' merciful rule. This is what we're receiving now and the future that is ours. And this is the point that the writer of Hebrews is making. We are subjects of the King. And in Revelation 1, John gets a sight of him, a sight of Jesus in his glory and majesty. He gets to see Jesus as he is. And the figure that confronts John is not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. When worldly people think about Jesus, they generally think of an insipid figure in Sunday school pictures. 
or if they've nailed to a cross, suffering on a crucifix. Well, that's not Jesus as he is now. He has suffered, as he said to John in Revelation 1, I was dead. He died for our sins to reconcile us to God. But he was resurrected, he ascended, and now he is glorified and enthroned in the heavens. He is Lord. He said, I am the living one, I was dead, and now look, look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus is God. He is the King. And the sight that confronted John was awesome in the truest sense of the word. Jesus stood before him, his eyes like blazing fire, his voice like the sound of many rushing waters, his tongue a sharp two-edged sword, his face shining like the sun in the strength of noonday. Confronted with this awesome majesty, John fell at his feet as though dead. So overwhelming was the sight. <laughs> we need to recapture who Jesus is. His might, his majesty, and his holiness. We need to recover a sense of his power and his mercy. His ability to help us. His willingness to answer prayer. For this is our Saviour God. And this is the one with, with, with whom every human being will have to do. When you realise just who Jesus is, that will certainly change your prayers and mine. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And since our God is a consuming fire, verse 29, let us worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. The first readers of, of the letter to the Hebrew had lost sight of who God is. And that was one of the reasons they were thinking of abandoning Christ, of returning to dry, dead legalism. We must not make the same mistake. To be able to live rightly, to be able to live victoriously, we need to have a right vision, a right view of God. In his love, yes, but in his power, his majesty, and his holiness. If we will recover a true vision of who he is, this means engaging with his word, with the Bible, <clears throat> if we will recover a right view of God our Saviour, then we'll relate rightly to him. If we recover a right vision of who he is, we will worship him acceptably, not presumptuously or contemptuously, but with reverence and with awe. Right worship is not just singing and prayer. God's idea of worship encompasses all of life. <coughs> worship is not just two and a half hours on a Sunday. Worship is our whole manner of living. Worship involves submitting our attitudes and our wills to his majesty and his lordship. Acceptable worship means living with a sense of reverence and awe. A sense of awe that motivates and governs us. And if we'll get this right, then we'll live right, then we'll pray right, and our lives will reflect his glory. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for the vision that John had in Revelation 1. The awesome, awe-filling view of our Saviour as he is. Father, grant that we might each recover that view. That we might each recover the understanding that you are a consuming fire. Grant that we might have a right vision of you, a right understanding, and that in response we might live and worship with reverence and with awe. Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.